Cindy met and fell in love with Rick Thomas during her freshman year of college. He was funny, energetic, and made her laugh like no other. He came up with funny ways to surprise her and always seemed to know the best way to show that he cared about her. Sometimes they would simply take long walks on Sunday afternoons or sneak into one of the empty campus buildings where they would sit and talk for hours. He was handsome and kind, which was a rare combination in college. Her parents loved him, and at first sight his whole family was in love with her too. Rick's sister, Katie, once said half-jokingly, If he ever breaks up with you, we will definitely miss him. By the middle of his senior semester, Rick had landed an entry-level job at a large investment firm on the West Coast. Cindy received her degree in education and began looking for teaching jobs in the District Orange, near where Rick works in Anaheim. The local school district hired her to teach 7th grade math. To celebrate their new job together, Rick took her to a celebratory dinner in San Clement overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Right before dessert, he got down on one knee and asked for her hand in marriage. The ring was magnificent, just under two carats, and fixed into a gold ring that belonged to his paternal grandmother. Cindy burst into tears of joy, hugged Rick with all her might, and whispered in his ear, Yes, yes, forever yes, and the audience around them burst into applause. Nine years later, Cindy was 32 years old and the mother of twins Michael and Sarah. They were six years old. Cindy was still teaching, but began to tire of the low pay and long hours. Even though she enjoyed some aspects of the job, being away from her family and dealing with her idiot parents convinced her that enough was enough. Both she and Rick were great at finance, so Cindy was able to leave her teaching job, even though it took her a year to get back on her feet. It only took five months, and it happened completely by accident. Cindy kept in touch with her best friend from college, Kelly. They met in their first year and immediately hit it off. They ended up living in the same room for all four years. After graduation, they lived together for nine months while Cindy was engaged to Rick. If Cindy was cheerful and adventurous, then Kelly was a hurricane. It would be hard to say that Kelly was taking a risk because Kelly didn't seem to know the meaning of the word. Along with being a free spirit, Kelly lacked a sense of planning and long-term thinking. She enjoyed the moment and rarely, if ever, thought, maybe I should stop and think about how this could all turn out. Without any look before you leap, Kelly took them on many adventures. Luckily for Kelly, she had Cindy to balance her and look out for her. More than once, Cindy saved Kelly from potential trouble. Kelly's temper flared in that moment, and she later thanked Cindy for being the friend she loved and needed. So, it was one of those occasions where Cindy was there to pull Kelly out of the fire when necessary and, as it turns out, inadvertently sent her career in a new direction. It was late January when Kelly called Cindy and asked her to be her couple for the wedding that would take place in three weeks. Kelly's boss got married and she was invited to the celebrations. She was eager to have fun and see what adventures might follow, but she grew emotionally and realized that it would be better if she had her friend by her side. This will be so much fun, Cindy, Kelly said, pleading with her friend. Lots of wine, dancing, and a bunch of cute young professionals. I'm married with a twin sister. That's what Cindy calls Kelly. Who's this so much fun for? Oh, don't be a prude, Kelly retorted. Let your gorgeous blonde hair down a little. A little fun away from Rick, and the kids might give you a boost. Rick gives me courage. Thank you, sis. How about I take it with me? Sorry, friend, but the invitation says guest, not guests, Kelly replied, wondering why her friend couldn't act a little more cheekily from time to time. Cindy ended their conversation by promising to talk to Rick and call her back. Later that evening, after the children had gone to bed, Cindy discussed the topic with her husband. His answer didn't surprise her. You better go and look after her, Cinderella. That's his pet nickname for her. I'm sure it will be fun. Maybe you could swing by Frog's Leap and buy us a box of their goodies. When she asked about the children, Rick replied, I've been wanting to see my mom and dad for a long time. It's been four months since our last visit, so I'm sure they will relish the opportunity to spend a long weekend with their grandchildren. 
go take care of your friend and have a twin-free weekend. She wondered how she married such a good-natured and generous man. After about ten minutes, she expressed her gratitude in a very loving manner. Three weeks later, a somewhat upset Cindy sat at a table in one of Napa's finest wineries. She watched Kelly dance with one of the groom's friends, who was probably eight years younger. While looking after her restless friend, Cindy chatted with one of the bride's cousins. They exchanged impressions of weddings and noted that this wedding started late and was generally disorganized. Sally, the cousin, casually remarked, someone could hit the jackpot if they were a great event coordinator. This got Cindy thinking, as she was also wondering how to get Kelly away from her 22-year-old dance partner, who clearly wanted to do something more than salsa. It took about six months of preparation, but Cindy finally started her new career with her own event planning business, We Plan, You Celebrate. She was an organizer by nature. Her lesson plans and classroom management were always impeccable, making the transition to weddings, homecomings, business meetings, and any other events seamless. She researched several good companies, learned everything she needed to know to find the right niche, and pursued her newfound passion with unflagging enthusiasm. Two years later, she has excelled in hosting small weddings, especially on the scenic California coast. It was then that she met Bennett Davis. Bennett owned three luxury boutique hotels, each ideal for weddings. San Diego, Santa Barbara, and the Monterey Peninsula each had one of his properties, and he performed well. He worked hard and had an incredible staff of employees, whom he paid well and from whom he demanded excellence. He used everything he had, and truth be told, this was true when he was 26 years old to buy a rundown 90-year-old mansion in Santa Barbara. He had enough money and courage to open it on time and at minimal cost. For the first two years, he worked more than 100 hours, seven days a week. He almost failed simply because word of mouth, even if it complemented it, spread painfully slowly. However, by the third year he broke even, and by the fourth year he began to make a profit. Three years later it opened in San Diego, and two years later the Monterey Gem became a reality. After 14 years, he was still serious about his business. He worked long and hard, but was also known to enjoy a good time, especially if it included fine wines, dancing and socializing with the opposite sex. Davis was, according to women who knew him well, a confirmed bachelor, not an asshole. He treated people fairly, even when he made it clear to potential fans that is not looking for a long-term relationship. At 40, he was comfortable in his own skin and very happy with the life he had built for himself. So, about 16 months before Cindy's meltdown, Davis Bennett and his Human Resources Director, Lori Templeton, were strolling through the Los Angeles Convention Center on South Figueroa, attending a meeting of hospitality industry service providers. At the end of the Third Island, having not yet found anything truly interesting, they came across Cindy Thomas and her exhibition, We Plan, You Pay. Bennett later confided in Cindy that he was impressed by her performance, but what caught his attention was her bright blue eyes, which hinted at a deeply mischievous nature. She later confided only to him that when she noticed him, she very, very subtly sensed that he was gorgeous, but not like a jerk. They started a conversation that lasted 45 minutes. It was professional, but the connection was instantaneous. He asked tough questions. What was her record? Who were the key people on her staff? How did she interact with the property management team? What was her worst event and why? The best and why? How did she determine overhead and profit? He also managed to ask a few casual but slightly personal questions. What's your favorite wine? Can you dance in a way that makes it worth it? Beach or mountains? He noticed her engagement ring, but simply enjoyed the friendly banter while he decided if she was the kind of person he wanted to do business with. For her part, she answered his questions with enthusiasm. She could tell he knew his stuff, but didn't seem to take himself too seriously. She also liked his more personal approach. Pinot Noir, only from the Willamette Valley and preferably 2014. In particular, Evening Land Lassors from the hills of Eola Amity. I can dance the waltz if necessary, but the Carlton, Twist, and Tango are my favorites, but only with my husband. In Winter Mountains. 
in summer any quiet beach. She smiled as she answered, but decided not to ask any questions about him. Lori Templeton took it all with a wry smile. She knew when her boss was genuinely interested in someone. He was very polite and friendly to everyone he met, but he had a habit of leaning in a little when he really wanted to interest the other person. When they finished the conversation and exchanged all the necessary information, Bennett said, Mrs. Templeton and I are going to have dinner at Fogo de Cao in a couple of hours. Would you like to join us? Lori noticed that he called her by her last name, which he rarely did, and assumed that he wanted to make sure Fatsendi realizes that his intentions were not inappropriate. Cindy made an excuse, saying that after she took down her sign, she was going home to watch Rick and the twins before bed. However, she also expressed interest in visiting the site and wondered if this would be possible in the next couple of weeks. By the time they finished, it was decided that she would visit his original location in Santa Barbara, his favorite of the three, a week later, starting Wednesday, for lunch and a tour. Lori and Cindy exchanged phone numbers, Cindy shook both of their hands and ended their conversation. As they walked away, Lori kept glancing at Bennett. He felt her gaze on him. What? He asked as innocently as possible. I believe you noticed the ring on her left hand. Well, a guy can flirt from time to time, can't he? He answered, pretending to be offended. She didn't even look at him, but answered knowingly, Oh, so that's what it was. Cindy's trip to the site couldn't have gone better. She arranged to meet Bennett and Lori for lunch. It was only 200 kilometers from their home in Orange County, but Cindy allowed herself four hours for the trip. She made it in less than three hours, so she had some time to explore the old mission, which was less than 15 minutes away. Always careful to watch the time, she arrived at 11.45. The parking attendant opened the door for her, smiled warmly and said, Welcome to the Winfield Scott Hotel, Mrs. Thomas. She was encouraged that the owners might actually be as nice as they claimed. As she walked up the short staircase into the hotel lobby, she looked up to see Bennett Davis, dressed in perfectly pressed khakis and a crisp navy blue MJ Bale shirt. His moccasins and belt were made of high-quality Italian leather. His clothes further emphasized his handsome features. The dark blue color brought out his dark hair and even darker brown eyes. Cindy rarely paid attention to men, with the exception of Rick. She wasn't prude or naive, she just had a man who she thought was great, so most others didn't compare to him. Bennett was on the same level in terms of looks, perhaps even a notch higher, and it took her by surprise. She also noted that Lori was not with him. I'm so glad you could come, Cindy. I'm excited to show you this place and think about how great it would be for both of us to collaborate. Bennett exclaimed, extending his hand in greeting. Thank you, Bennett. At first glance, this place seems wonderful, Cindy replied, shaking his hand with a warm smile. Neither of them may have realized it yet, but the connection they felt when they met in Los Angeles was genuine. They both respected hard work and success. Neither of them were pretentious or cared about people who were complacent. They both strived to be the best they could be, and none of them caught my eye. Cindy opted for a lightweight but relatively demure black sleeveless sundress from Tory Burch and a pastel linen scarf that added sparkle to her bright blue eyes. Her dress was just short of the knee, which showed off her long legs as much as she wanted. Her Stuart Weitzman sandals were comfortable yet stylish, with just the right amount of fit to bring her height up from 5'10 to 175. Cindy was a pragmatic woman. She knew that men like Bennett valued a woman's appearance, which never stopped them from doing business. However, some of her friends would call her innocent as a dove, but cunning like a fox. She took Bennett's hand and immediately began asking questions about the hotel as they entered the lobby. Every employee seemed to know her name, and when they arrived at the patio table to eat lunch, there was a small vase of California wildflowers in the center of the table. The lavender, dark red, and bright white colors worked very well with the white canvas and Pacific blue background. Unsurprisingly, there was also a bottle of Pinot Noir, which Cindy had mentioned when they first met. As Bennett pushed her chair back, she thought, This guy is very good. 
I need to be on top so I don't get robbed. They chatted for a few minutes about the trip, the recent forest fires, and the gorgeous view of the ocean. Ten minutes later, Lori came running around the corner, smiling, holding a small folder in her hands, intended for the business part of the meeting. Cindy stood up and hugged her. Even though she was fascinated by Bennett, she also genuinely liked what she learned about Lori and was happy to see her. Over lunch, the three chatted for another 45 minutes and then got down to business. Cindy limited her wine consumption to a glass and a half to avoid distractions and also to make it clear to potential partners that she was here to work, not have fun. After lunch, Lori excused herself and Bennett spent the next hour giving her a tour of Winfield Scott. Cindy was not a newbie and was well prepared. She knew the hotel must have been named after the famous 1583 shipwreck off the coast of Santa Barbara. The ship sank with a cargo of one five million gold coins, and she joked that perhaps Bennett's luck had something to do with finding the treasure. He smiled, winked, and replied, This is not the treasure I need. They laughed and continued the tour. Lori joined them a little later, and they moved into Bennett's office to discuss the options in detail. They came to several mutually beneficial agreements that Cindy would officiate weddings and family functions at Bennett's hotel, and everyone seemed pleased with the possibilities. Late in the evening, when their business was completed, Bennett drove Cindy's white Volkswagen Passat to the front door. Lori said goodbye, and they sat together for a while. Bennett shook her hand firmly, but also warmly, perhaps lingering a little longer than he should have, and said, It was nice being with you today and getting to know you better. I know we could make a great business together, but I'm also excited to get to know you better as a person. Then he leaned over and kissed her politely on the cheek. Cindy smiled, thanked him for the wonderful day, and said she would contact Lori about a couple of weddings that she thought would be perfect for the venue. As she drove down the long driveway and left the hotel grounds, she experienced a strange sensation that took her by surprise. She realized that Bennett was a strong physical attraction to her. She shook her head as if trying to get rid of these thoughts. She was still daydreaming when she glanced in the rearview mirror before changing lanes. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed a book in the back seat. It was one of Sarah's favorite books that she must have left in the car. The most remarkable thing was that it lay with the cover facing up, and this quickly returned her to the real world. Oh girl, she thought, you spend too much time with Kelly. You are not a 16-year-old sophomore, but you are a happily married woman. Get your head out of your ass. She was genuinely unhappy with herself. She was married to an amazing man and had two beautiful children. There was no room in her life for acting like a frivolous teenager, much less flirting with anyone other than Rick Thomas. After spending 20 minutes telling herself off, she turned on a podcast that discussed women's issues in business and began to distance herself. However, if she were honest with herself, she would admit that she had come too close to the dangerous line. Returning to the hotel, Bennett went into his office and quickly took care of a few business matters. Then he retired to his room to rest for an hour before his evening jog along the beach. He took off his clothes and stretched out on the bed. He began to think about the past day and, in particular, about her. She was beautiful both inside and out. Bennett had dated several attractive women in his life, some of them even stunning, but none of them were quite like Cindy. Her eyes, her personality, her prominent legs, the way she walked, and most importantly, the view that greeted him when she left all this was spinning in his head. She was married as hell, but she was amazing. At this very moment, Rick was at home with Michael and Sarah, preparing dinner. He thought about Cindy too as he walked around the kitchen, preparing their food and laughing with the children. At that moment, he realized how truly happy he was. The table was set when Cindy arrived, and they enjoyed an hour of eating while Sarah told the story of how she found the neighbor's cat, Ralph, in their yard and played with him for a while before Mrs. Bowling came and took him home. She thought about getting them a pet. After six months and four of them were weddings at Winfield Scott, the border was crossed, although not without warning. It may have started with a casual touch on the arm or with Bennett placing his hand on the small of her back while holding the door for her. 
Perhaps it was because of the time they spent together, as Bennett made it a point to stop by Cindy's every time she was out and about. Be that as it may, Cindy never shied away from his gestures, compliments, and even slight flirting. Rick only went with her once to check out the venue, but that was early on, and Bennett was away on other business that day. Or so they were told. It was almost one in the morning. Cindy and Lori had just said goodbye to their very happy bride's parents after another extremely successful wedding. The cleanup crew was almost done when Cindy and Lori sat alone on the patio, enjoying a glass of fine Dom Perignon left over from the reception. Okay, technically they could accidentally take it out of the bar and put it in Lori's bag, which inadvertently ended up in the very back of the giant hotel refrigerator under a box of lettuce, but mistakes like that happen. I know it's late, Lori said, kicking off her shoes that were terribly pressing on her feet. But can we talk for a minute? Of course, Cindy replied, repeating her friend's idea and rubbing her toes. Anything specific? You know that I really enjoyed working with you and I consider you my friend, right? Lori said with some trepidation in her voice. Cindy nodded in agreement, wondering where this would lead and I don't think I have the right to interfere in other people's affairs without an invitation, but I need to tell you something, otherwise I'll feel like I've let you down. This is fine, Cindy did not answer, but nodded her head in agreement. You know he'll sleep with you if you let him, Lori said quietly. Cindy raised an eyebrow, but didn't answer, and she continued. I love you both madly, but the first day we met in Los Angeles, I realized that you were the kind of woman Bennett liked. Quite frankly, you are stunningly beautiful both inside and out. You're an attractive woman with an amazing head on your shoulders, and it drives him crazy. The only reason he doesn't get overly persistent is because he respects you and your marriage. I won't say that he would never destroy your marriage, because that's not true. He may not think that sleeping with you would be harmful if it remained a secret, but deep down he knows what tragic consequences it could lead to. One of the things that makes him so great in business is his ability to think five steps ahead while other guys are still on the second step. So he's laying low and taking his time. But if he decides that's what you want, he won't hesitate to get you into bed. Cindy listened intently, although she had difficulty maintaining eye contact with Lori, whose gaze was not accusing or judgmental, but was not gentle either. Cindy, I don't see how you can sleep with Bennett and keep your life intact. He won't take you away from Rick and marry you. You don't get divorced with your husband. You won't leave the twins and sail off into the sunset. Bennett is not an asshole. He won't leave you, and in fact, whether you have sex or not, he'll probably remain your friend for life. He's head over heels in love with you and incredibly devoted to you. It's not just business, although he's very impressed by your traits. He loves you for who you are as a person, but not enough to settle down with you. You have to ask yourself if you want your family to be what it is today or have a fuck buddy for the rest of your life, and there is about a 95% chance that it will ruin your marriage. Cindy had tears in her eyes as she answered. Oh, Lori, I'm so confused. I do not know what to do. Rick is an amazing man. Even 10 years into our marriage, we laugh easily, have long, serious conversations, and have fun in bed. He supports me and challenges me in all the right ways. I can't imagine my life without him, and the thought of hurting him makes me sick. But Bennett, her voice broke for a moment. She tried to find the words. He's intoxicating in a way that Rick is not. I feel like he's dangerous, but in a good way anyway. Of course, in the sense that I want him in every way. She paused for a moment and took a couple sips of champagne. Lori gave herself time to catch her breath without interfering. She wanted her new friend to struggle with reality without saving her. Whatever decision Cindy makes must be her own. Lori worked up the courage to tell her the truth, but now it was time to shut up and listen. I have never felt depressed by anyone in my life. I fell desperately in love with Rick pretty quickly, but I wouldn't say I was so overwhelmed that I lost control of myself. The way I feel about Bennett is out of control. When he looks at me a certain way, touches my hand, or even leans towards me, I just melt inside. I don't know why, but I know that if the right moment came and he took me to his bed, 
I would willingly give myself to him. She continued, Six months ago, I would have been offended if anyone had suggested that someone might be more desirable than my husband, or that I might be having an affair. I'm not progressive. I think all this nonsense about women being free to act outside of marriage and expecting their husbands to be faithful is completely pointless. Marriage is a commitment in both respects. I tried to imagine Rick coming home and telling me he was with another woman, and it kills me to even think about it. So why am I such a fucking hypocrite and playing with fire? What are you going to do? Lori asked tenderly, saddened by her friend's pain. Well, I'm 80% sure that I will remain faithful to my husband and children, Cindy began. I'm not going to quit working with you guys because it's too good of a deal to pass up. That 80% says I can do this and not give in to the urge. But the remaining 20% say, fuck him, fuck him, fuck him. This suggests that I can hide it and keep a low profile. This suggests that I can let it run its course, put it out of my mind, and then get back to what I think it should be. Honestly, I'm not sure. Most of the time I dream of winning 80%. But there are moments. At that moment, she clasped her head in her hands and began to sob. Lori stood up and walked over to Cindy's side of the table. Taking her friend into her arms, she held her for several moments without saying a word. Finally, she said, Well, you know the truth. You know the risks, and I really hope you make good decisions in the future. The next day, Lori walked into Bennett's office uninvited and with a grim expression on her face. She met her boss's gaze and held his gaze for a moment before speaking. If you sleep with her, I will quit and will never work for you again. And don't think you can hide this from me, boss. I've worked next to you almost every day for the past seven years. I will find out, even if you hide it. I will find out. She turned without waiting for an answer, and leaving almost, but not quite, slammed the door behind her. Ultimately, it was the perfect storm. Three weeks after Lori talked to Cindy and talked to Bennett, they had the rarest of circumstances. Heavy downpour during a thunderstorm that came out of the blue almost completely ruined an outdoor wedding. Everyone rushed to help move the house into the house, with Cindy and Laura shouting directions to the staff as they tried to get the bride and groom into the hotel lobby. Four hours later, well after midnight, the only thing that had survived was that the reception was as good as it could be and everyone had gone to their rooms to go to bed. Cindy and Bennett stood at the far end of the patio, in the shade, away from prying eyes. Bennett put his arm around Cindy's shoulders. He knew she was upset, even though she couldn't control the weather. She always strived for perfection, and that was one of the things that attracted him to her. As he lightly hugged her, looking out over the Pacific Ocean, he said, You did your best, partner. You can't dictate to Mother Nature, and everyone had a great time despite the downpour. Heck, in a couple of years, they'll be talking about it around the Thanksgiving table, causing laughs for years to come. Cindy didn't move away. She let her head rest against his chest. It felt so good to be so close, to feel so safe. But 80% of Cindy began to lose the battle. She took a deep breath, as if giving up, said nothing, turned to hug Bennett, and looked into his eyes. Before leaning down and kissing her, he said, Think about it carefully. I'm not going to pressure you. You must want this as much as I do. If not, let's remain friends and business partners. We may always wonder, what if? But if it's not 100% true, we should stop right now. In the next moment, these 80% dissolved. A line had been crossed, and they both took a step that in a few months they would regret for the rest of their lives. 20% took over Cindy. They talked for the next two hours. How will they keep this a secret? What precautions will they take to prevent their date from becoming public? He was worried that she would feel guilty, and then it would all be over. She assured him that she knew how to deal with her emotions and wanted to be with him as often as possible without arousing suspicion. She kissed him goodnight and said that she would go home after sleeping for three, four hours. She wanted to rest before returning to her family. She actually wanted to sleep until noon but she knew that would arouse suspicion. He promised to accompany her when she left. Cindy then quietly crept into her room, set her alarm, fell onto her bed, and fell asleep instantly. 
Bennett removed the sheets from the bed, washed them himself, made the bed, and was asleep before the morning crew arrived at 6.30 a.m. What could go wrong? On Sunday, she arrived home in the afternoon. Sarah and Michael heard her drive up, and she had barely gotten out of the car when they put their arms around her waist. They were almost eight years old and already grown up. She hadn't been home since Friday afternoon, but they had flooded her with good news about the weekend. Yesterday, Dad took us to a big children's park, and we rode on a giant slide. Ralph came back, and Mrs. Bowling brought us cookies when she came to pick him up. Dad made us Mickey Mouse pancakes for breakfast and said that maybe next week we could go to Disneyland and go on the rides. Mommy, has your dad ever taken you on rides? The last question made her flinch slightly. The mention of daddy and rides reminded her of the rough conversation she had exchanged with her lover just 12 hours ago. Yes, she thought, going to get her bag with her things. Because of yesterday's night walks, she had a slightly strange gait today. She mentally cringed when she saw Rick standing in the doorway, wiping his hands on a kitchen towel. He was wearing Adidas shorts and one of his cycling shirts. Damn it, she thought, he looks so good. What the hell am I doing? As she set the bag down and they hugged, she said, Hey baby, it was a tough wedding. I'm so glad to be home in your arms. I hope the twins weren't too crazy. We always miss you, Cinderella, but I love spending time with the children on weekends. I'm so glad your business is thriving. I looked at the barometer when the storm was on the news, and I knew you had your hands full. Let me pour you a glass of wine and rub your feet. He loves children so much, he sacrifices himself so that I can do my job. Damn, that's not the right word, girl. Get a hold of yourself. Now wine and foot massage. I can't lose him or this family. Later, after the kids had gone to bed, they decided to drink wine and chat in the hot tub. Luckily for Cindy, Rick admitted that he was very tired. She feigned slight disappointment, but quickly admitted that she, too, had been beaten. She didn't explain the real reason, and he didn't ask because he didn't expect anything but fidelity from his wife. On Monday, Rick asked her if she was going out on Tuesday night. She quickly replied in the affirmative. Early Tuesday morning, while Cindy was still asleep, he got up and secretly packed some things for both of them. Before leaving for work, he left her a note. Dress for the date in a cute casual Cinderella style, a bright blue sundress that shows off your legs if you don't mind and be ready by 4 p.m. Don't worry about the kids, everything is ready. At four o'clock sharp, they hugged the children and thanked Kelly, who had come into town and agreed to look after the children. Then they got into the car and drove away. Rick took her to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel overlooking Dana Point. Cindy was stunned when they pulled into the parking lot. Is Kelly staying with us for the night? Yes. I didn't take a change of clothes with me. Well, I hope you don't need too many clothes, but you do have a bag in the trunk. While you were bathing the children early in the morning, Kelly double-checked everything. She may have changed what you'll wear to bed tonight. You let her get into my underwear drawer. Yes. She mentioned it was evening wear for a boring housewife, but she found something hot pink that she thought would suit it. She also told me not to worry. She'll take you lingerie shopping this week. They walked along the beach for a long time and had a delicious dinner. Around midnight, they sat on the balcony of their sixth-floor room, looking out over the unusually calm Pacific Ocean, and talked about their lives, dreams, and futures. Rick shared the big news that he had become a partner, which meant more money and less travel. He even talked about the possibility of sometimes accompanying her on weekends to the wedding. It was dark, and they were both looking at the ocean, which meant he couldn't see her face. If he could, it might have been his first sign that something was wrong. Cindy quickly came to her senses, stood up, walked over, and sat on his lap. I'm so proud of you, Richard Michael Thomas. While having a leisurely breakfast in bed, they picked up where they left off a few hours earlier. Baby, I'm so proud of your upcoming promotion and would love it if you traveled with me from time to time. But I hope you don't think I should quit my business because we can afford it. Never, Rick answered. I know how much you enjoy it and your career is just as important to me as my own. 
You're great at what you do, and I want you to take it as far as you want. How the hell did I find such an amazing guy? She thought to herself. I can't ruin everything. Bennett and I need to review our plans to make sure they are correct. The complete lack of logic and love never occurred to her. There was not a drop of guilt, only the desire to make this dream come true. In the years to come, she would wonder to herself how she could be such a selfish idiot. Men are often guilty of thinking outside their own head, but in truth, that's exactly what Cindy did. When she turned 30, she somehow convinced herself that she could have it all and no one would get hurt. She was sure that at some point, in a few years, she and Bennett would break up. She knew there was a deep emotional connection between them, but Bennett would never truly fall in love, and she would never leave her family. He will find another woman to steer his ship, and she will enjoy a long life with her loving husband. The twins' high school years, college, weddings, and grandchildren all seemed to be part of the plan she thought was at stake. Never, even in her wildest thoughts, could she imagine the impending tragedy? The next month, Rick was promoted to partner, and she had another wedding, this time at a San Diego hotel, and she had a long conversation with her lover about how to secure what they were doing. Cindy took the pills for two years. Once she opened her business, she and Rick decided that having two wonderful children was enough for both of them. At the end of June, the situation began to clear up. Bennett and Cindy were in his office, discussing some new terms of their agreement. Bennett initially offered some bonus incentives if Cindy brought in more clients than expected. They may have been lovers and their dates were still wild, but as the Mafia always said, it's business, not personal, and Cindy reminded Bennett of their deal. He lamented that he had underestimated her business savvy, but accepted what was due to her. At that moment, Lori appeared at the door. I'm glad I found you two together. I need to talk to both of you, Lori said, without waiting for an invitation to join the conversation. She plopped down into one of the leather chairs and continued. Bennett, do you remember our conversation about four months ago? I told you that if you two slept together, I would leave. Cindy's face showed shock and then confusion. Bennett was a top poker player and remained resilient. The fact that you ignored this warning or simply chose sex over me was unexpected but I think it was inevitable. On the night of the storm, I was on the second floor on the patio, and I saw you violate my warning. It was one of the saddest moments of my adult life, not just because of me, but because of what I firmly believe it could do to both of you. She continued, I'm not judging, but I can't be part of this. Cindy began to object, but Lori raised her hand, indicating that she was not finished yet. Actually, I think I'm being judgmental. I think what you are doing is short-sighted and childishly selfish. You are behaving like teenagers who only think about their own pleasure and not about more serious consequences. The following Monday, I started looking for a new job. The only reason it took me so long is because I had to look at several good deals. I'm moving to Austin, Texas in early August and will be working for an event planning company there. Then she turned her gaze to Cindy. Please remember that I warned you, Cindy. This shit may not be over yet, but don't think that whoever hears it won't come and get what they deserve. I'm disappointed in you, even though I've known you for less than a year. You seem to lack common sense, let alone loyalty to the vows you made to God, your family and friends when you married Rick. He doesn't deserve what you do to him. I won't drag your kids into this because honestly, when I think about the damage this will end up doing to them, it makes me want to cry. Lori concluded by addressing them both. I'll be a professional. I will not let this affect the good years we have had, and I intend to fulfill my obligations. Bennett visibly flinched when he heard this. But please only talk to me about work, not about what you two are doing. Don't make any excuses or make a scene. The staff here are amazing, and I know they don't deserve to be dragged into this. I will tell them that I simply could not refuse the offer, and I am sure that you will find a worthy replacement. If you ask me, Sharon, your head bartender, would be a good choice, but it's up to you. Thank you for seven wonderful years, and I wish you both success. With these words, she stood up and left the room. Tears streamed down Cindy's face and Bennett lowered his head. 
They sat for a few minutes in complete silence, feeling the gentle breeze blow through the open French doors. They had planned to spend the evening together and everything that went with it, but that obviously wasn't meant to be. Neither of them knew what to say. Cindy finally wiped away her tears. Bennett, I'm going home. Now is not the time to try to figure things out. I know we are both to blame, but for my part, I deeply regret my role in what happened. I'll call you in a few days. She then stood up and walked out of his office and out of the hotel. She asked the valet to bring her car because she unexpectedly had to return home. She drove back to Orange County, crying the whole way, and checked into the courtyard Marriott, using her signature American Express because Rick wouldn't even look at him. On the way, she stopped in time to buy a bottle of Maker's Mark. She went up to her room and drank until she fell asleep. The first shoe dropped. Lori kept her promise and moved to Austin about ten days after working her final two weeks for Bennett. He never tried to talk her out of it or offer her more money. He knew it would only offend her. He tried to broach the subject once or twice, but Lori refused. You have nothing to say, Bennett, was her answer. Cindy wanted to call, but couldn't find the words. Finally, she wrote to Lori, I'm sorry my actions hurt you. You warned me, but I can't let this go. In early September, things were a little tense between Bennett and Cindy. Perhaps they were both struggling with guilt, or perhaps they were just annoyed that Lori had brought them up to talk. However, their passion for each other never waned, and by early October they were back to their previous form. One Saturday evening, after the morning wedding, they had an unusually long evening. They left Washington and drove Bennett's BMW M8 series convertible along the coast to a secluded chalet overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Oh God, this is great, Cindy meowed. Before leaving, Cindy told Rick that she was going on a reconnaissance mission in the Monterey area and would not return home until late Sunday evening. It was absolutely true. She just didn't tell him that she was going to travel with her lover. Bennett checked out of the hotel late at 2 p.m., so on Sunday morning they walked along the beach, ate brunch, and just spent time together before it was time to head back. Along the way, they stopped in Big Sur for a glass of wine. They drove south for the rest of the five-hour drive, and Cindy felt so content and full of life that she marveled at her luck. Her business was thriving, her children were doing well, she had two wonderful men in her life, and she was sure that Lori's fears were unfounded. It had been fifteen months since she had met Bennett, eight months since they began their illicit affair, although Cindy would have called it something else, and everything seemed to be just fine. Her absolute selfishness is that she taught Rika and regularly lied to him, and did not give her peace for a second. In fact, she was so out of touch with reality that she believed that her once-a-month whirlwind fling with Bennett was good for her as a wife. She was close to realizing how wrong she had been. The first weekend in December, Cindy hosted a wedding at Bennett's Hotel, located east of Barrick Park. Spanish Moss was a little smaller than Bennett's other establishments, but was ideal for wedding parties of 50 or fewer people. There were 38 people at the wedding in Carlisle, which meant two things. Cindy made this event very easy to organize, and not all of the hotel rooms were booked. If Bennett had looked at the reservation list, he would have noticed that a Mr. Thomas had booked a Belladonna room with an ocean view, a large hot tub, and a king-size four-poster bed. Mrs. Cass Thomas was not on the list. Mr. Thomas, a new partner in an investment firm, was planning to surprise his wife and spend the weekend with her. He took care of all the details, including fresh-cut flowers, Cindy's favorite wine perfectly chilled, and the best bubble bath oils. Rick didn't feel like he and his wife were growing apart, but he did feel like they had lost some sense of connection and intimacy. He naively chalked it up to long hours of work and raising children. He was about to find out how wrong he was. Since none of the local staff had ever met Rick, it was easy for him to wait until after the rehearsal dinner for Cindy to finish her work. He had spotted Bennett twice before, but he was out of sight and easily hidden. He thought about calling Bennett and letting him in on his plan, but he didn't know him very well and didn't want to risk him spilling the beans. An hour after dinner ended, when Cindy had not yet appeared in the hall, 
Rick decided to find her and give her a surprise. However, he did not find her either in the room where dinner was served or in the courtyard outside the establishment. He did hear voices around the corner, and one of the voices undoubtedly belonged to his wife. Perhaps she was discussing some details of tomorrow's wedding with one of the staff. A moment before he turned the corner, he heard his wife say in a passionate voice, Not here, baby. Please, wait until we get back to your room. A second later, Rick turned the corner, not believing his ears, but was immediately confronted with the most terrible sight of his life. His loving wife stood in an embrace with another man. Cindy opened her eyes for a split second and screamed, Rick, what knee it? Bennett turned his head and immediately released Cindy from his embrace. He stepped back as if he saw the ghost of Christmas yet to come in his own tombstone. His gloomy face turned pale. Rick, for his part, realized all this and instantly realized that his life was over. He leaned against the wall and tears instantly appeared in his eyes. He felt himself continue to fall to his knees as he began to realize what was happening. Cindy walked up to him as he stood bent over on all fours, shaking violently. Rick, baby, please. Oh, Rick, oh no, what have I done? Too stunned to react quickly, Rick allowed Cindy to hug him for a moment, and they both began to sob. Bennett, for his part, took a few steps back, putting his hands behind his head, as if he had just run a long sprint and was trying to catch his breath. There was horror in his eyes. After a moment, Rick looked up at Cindy, who was holding his face in her hands. He said the only word that came to his mind. Why? Cindy began to answer, but as Rick gradually came to his senses, anger began to arise in him. No, Cindy, he said, standing up abruptly and stepping back. She knelt and looked at him with pleading eyes, but could not utter a word. No matter what she said at that moment, it still wouldn't have changed anything. No, Cindy, don't talk to me. Don't say a single fucking word. He looked at Bennett with hatred. Take her to your room, bastard. She's all yours. As he turned to leave, Cindy stood up and tried to reach him from behind. He turned sharply to her. Don't you dare touch me. You are the mother of my children. You were the love of my life. You were everything to me, and now you have destroyed us. You destroyed me. Just get away with your stallion and leave me alone. Cindy was left with the only glimmer of common sense she had shown over the past year. She let go of Rick. She knew that now was not the time or place to try to calm him down, explain, lie or anything else. She broke his heart. She saw it in his eyes. She needed to leave him alone. For now, she herself was in a state of shock and still would not have been able to utter a single meaningful word. She turned to Bennett and motioned for him to leave her alone. She then returned to her room to a perfectly made bed with perfectly white sheets, pillows and a blanket. She threw herself on the bed. Cindy Thomas desperately tried to control her heartbeat and breathing. The 34-year-old wife and mother of twins found herself in a crisis situation of her own making and was terrified that there was no way out. For his part, Rick began to gather his thoughts and emerge from the emotional fog that was stifling his ability to think. He returned to his room and sat motionless at his desk for an hour. At some point, he was able to come to his senses and begin to think about what he should do. He knew he wouldn't stay here a millisecond longer than necessary. But what should he do? Where should he go? He decided it was best to go home. He won't arrive before 7 a.m. anyway and can go into the office, which is empty on Sunday. He could shower, shave and change into clean clothes. By then he would have occasion to inform Mrs. Bowling of his early return. He could pretend for a while, if only for the sake of his children. Before leaving, he wrote Cindy a note and left it on the table in an envelope with her name on it. Cindy, I'm going home to the children. I don't know what else to do right now and I need time to think. To say that you broke my heart and soul would be like saying that the Titanic had a small leak. I'm sinking into despair and have no idea where to go. When you return home, or if you return, please write to me in advance. I plan to leave as soon as you arrive. I won't talk to you and I don't even want to look at you until I have time to weigh everything that happened. I'll tell the kids that I have to go out of town this week for work 
but their mom will be home with them. I hate the thought of leaving these precious lives with you, but I have no other choice right now. Don't try to call, text, or contact me in any way after you let me know you'll be a few minutes away. I know that I cannot trust you to comply with my request, but I hope that in your callous heart there is at least an ounce of humanity left to take this first step towards our disintegration. In fact, you took the first steps when you started sleeping with your boyfriend, no matter how long ago it was. I loved you with all my heart, mind, and soul, and you gave up on it and left me. At this moment, I hate you with fierce hatred. How the hell could you? Rick. When Bennett came out of his room about an hour later, he found Rick had left. He also discovered the note and took it to Cindy the next morning. He was going to tell her directly, but he stood at her door while she cried and didn't have the heart to tell her the even worse news. He cursed himself for taking their date so lightly. He was always on guard and should have been prepared for a possible disaster, but he didn't, and now someone he cared about so much was broken, and he didn't have the strength to help heal. Later, when her sobs had subsided, and it was clear that she had passed out briefly, he sneaked into her room and placed a note on her bedside table. He then walked over and stood guard at her door. He didn't know why, but he felt like he had to do something. Cindy woke up around 6 a.m. after three hours of restless tossing and turning. She had no intention of sleeping at all, but the emotional shock exhausted her. She got up, washed her face, and peed. She started crying again when she came out of the bathroom, and that's when she saw the note. Cindy prided herself on standing up for herself, her family, and her friends, but when she looked at the envelope, she was completely at a loss. She already knew that this would be bad, even terrible, and she also knew that she deserved the message that Rick had conveyed. Quietly, with tears in her eyes, she sat down on the bed, opened it, and read it. She collapsed on the floor again, sobbing uncontrollably. Bennett entered the room, knelt down next to her, and hugged her. She pressed herself close to him. Deep down, she wanted to blame him, to lash out at him for seducing her, but she knew that their relationship was a two-way street. She remembered the first time he had demanded that she agree to everything or he would stop immediately. She also remembered Lori's warnings. No, Cindy understood that a lot had happened to her, including very bad things, but she was not a victim. She made her choice, and now she had to live with it. I'll go home as soon as I can pull myself together, Bennett. I don't know what will happen, but I have to accept the challenge. I know, Cindy. I wish things were different, but I know you well enough now to know that you won't run, hide, or blame your decisions on others. You are an amazing woman and friend. If I could accept it from you, I would, but I know I can't. Just know I'm always here. Thank you, Bennett. I sincerely hope this doesn't hurt you, but who knows? I'll probably call you with an update when I know how things are but I think we should both be prepared for the possibility that we may never speak to each other again. He hugged her tightly, like a friend, not like a lover, and simply said, I know. Then he stood up and left the room, quietly closing the door behind him. He told the staff to move her car, but to leave her alone. She had a difficult family situation and was a little upset this morning. The new employees shook their heads affirmatively and went about their business. Veterans were not fools. They knew who Mr. Pine Thomas was and what happened. For the rest of the day, the entire hotel was in turmoil. When Cindy was 15 minutes from her house, she texted Rick. Five minutes left. Could you leave when the kids are asleep and we can talk? It's my fault, but I hope everything gets better. Cinderella. Rick replied, I'm ready to go. The kids have had dinner. This is our last contact until I contact you again, Cindy. Please comply with my request. She began to cry again when she realized that the name Cinderella would most likely never pass his lips again. She was no longer his loving wife and best friend. She was his unfaithful wife who showed him the worst possible disrespect. In the arms of another man, what will happen to all of them at the end of what had become the longest week of her life? Rick called. She answered after the first ring. Hello, Rick. I'm glad you called, she said in a kind and hopeful voice. He answered in an even voice. Cindy, 
I'll be home this afternoon around 5 p.m. I somehow managed to cope with work all week. He began to choke, but did not have time to pull himself together, and there was a painful pause. She was waiting. I will put on a poker face and try to be myself in the presence of children. I pray that I have the strength to hold on for three hours. Then I will go to sleep in the spare room and will not talk to you until tomorrow morning when the children wake up. I'll try to get up early so they don't notice how we settled down to sleep. Does it suit you? Yes, Rick, Cindy answered quietly. Whatever you think, it will be better. When do you think we can talk? She didn't want to push too hard, but even though she knew it was all her fault, she was dying to understand what was going on in his head. I agreed with Mrs. Bowling to babysit on Sunday afternoon. We can find a secluded corner in the park to sit and talk. I think it's best if we stay with the kids all day Saturday, since we're not sure how many more days we'll have with them, if any. His words, if we ever do, hit her like an unexpected blow to the stomach. She almost vomited from the pain she heard in his voice. She had never heard anything like this from him before. He was always strong, even when things were difficult. On the other hand, it has never been so difficult. Betrayal was a cruel punishment. Okay, honey, that's all she said. Cindy, Rick answered in such an emotionless tone that it shook her to the core. Please don't ever talk to me so kindly again. I'm not cute or a baby, and you're certainly not my Cinderella. We're two adults having a terrible nightmare, and we can't wake up soon if we ever wake up. Never again use words that purport to express love or affection for me. Please. He hung up without waiting for an answer. Cindy leaned back in her chair, her shoulders shaking with sobs. Somehow they made it through pizza and a movie on Friday night, and even laughed a little at Michael's story about why he thought the family should buy a dog. Saturday passed in the same spirit, pretending that everything was fine. A couple of times they thought Sarah sensed something was wrong, but they did their best to act like a loving couple in front of their children. The worst moment was when Michael called them out for a group hug while they were walking on the beach. The dead look Cindy saw in Rick's eyes almost broke her, even though his hug was tight and he lied about his true feelings. On Sunday morning, they ate pancakes and lounged around in their pajamas. Rick announced to the children that mom and dad were going out together and that Mrs. Bowling would be watching them in the afternoon. Sarah and Michael were not happy with the idea. They wanted to spend more time as a family, but their father was adamant, so they ran to their rooms to change for the rest of the day. When they reached the park, they walked for a while until they found a quiet, secluded place where there was a small picnic table. Rick sat down facing the park opposite Cindy. Just like always, she thought, he always wants to see the crowd around him, to know if any trouble is coming to him. I'd like you to start first, if you don't mind, Rick began. I'm afraid if I speak first, I won't be able to control my words. I promise I won't interrupt you, and I want you to say whatever you want. It's up to you to decide whether it will take five minutes or fifty. It is important to me that you express your opinion. If this is acceptable, please feel free to start at any time that suits you. Cindy thought for a moment. It was like a negotiation, and in such an environment she never wanted to talk first. However, she herself instigated this, so it would be right if Rick was allowed to carry on the conversation as he saw fit. Of course, Cindy replied, trying to sound supportive of his wishes. I'm not sure where to start, Rick. I've been thinking about what I would say since last Friday, but she didn't finish. She couldn't bring herself to remember that moment and the horror, pain and utter despair that she saw in his eyes. You deserve the truth, and I will try to give it to you. I had a physical relationship with Bennett for almost eight months. Hearing this confession, he put his head in his hands, but then raised his eyes, as if saying, Continue. I have never been attracted to a man, and I have never had any inappropriate relationships with anyone before meeting him. I didn't seek him out or pursue him because there was something missing in our relationship. Although I didn't pursue him, I can't say I resisted his friendship and flirtation. I realized early on that, while the business side of it can be amazing, for the first time in my life I was drawn to someone other than my husband. 
I'm not defending him or trying to make things worse for you than they already were, but the first time we were together, he stopped me before our first kiss and made me decide whether we were going to move on or not. He said he didn't want to put pressure on me and would only continue if I wanted it as much as he did. I continued walking. Nobody forced me. Nobody forced me to do anything I didn't want to do. I can't yet say why I was attracted to it or why I did what I did, but I'm not going to play the victim. Whatever happens between us rests entirely on my shoulders. Small. She quickly recovered. I'm sorry, Rick. I want to tell you that I love you with all my heart. That it meant nothing to me, and I beg you to forgive me and give us a chance to heal. But now I know that I have been hiding a part of my heart from you for the past few months. You didn't notice any difference, at least I don't think so. But when I was with you, a tiny part of me was somewhere else. With Bennett. If it weren't for that, I would never have done what I did. I lied to you, and I lied to myself. I told myself that I truly loved you, that this would pass, and everything would be just fine. You'd be blissfully unaware, and we'd raise our children and grow old together. I think deception starts with yourself before you can deceive others. So, I betrayed everything that was dear to me. I had no idea how this would turn out or how it would affect our children, but I know that nothing good will come of it, even if our relationship can be saved. Finally, at least for this first conversation, I want to say how terrible I feel about what I did. Sorry, I can't describe my emotions. I don't regret being caught. I am devastated by what I did to the only person who has ever loved me unconditionally for who I am. Whatever happens to us, I will need professional help to figure it out. I screwed up more than I thought. I've always considered myself a pretty good person. I discovered, perhaps too late, that this was not the case. I have deep flaws that are ugly. They are mine and no one else's. I am responsible. I'm very ashamed and I want you to know it. Rick hung his head and cried. It was good that they were on the sidelines because he was overwhelmed with emotions. Joy, contentment, friendship, love and mutual respect have all disappeared, giving way to despair, grief, loss, humiliation and emptiness. He wanted to respond with anger, yell at her and insult her, but he didn't have the strength to do so. She'd probably be happy to go on a tirade about the quiet sobs struggling from his mouth. And again, it was like a ton of bricks had hit her, how much she had taken from him. After ten minutes, which seemed like ten hours to her, he finally gathered his courage and spoke. His voice was barely louder than a whisper, but not weak. This was a given. Cindy, I don't know if this is the last time we talk alone, just the two of us, as husband and wife, or not. I'm still trying to sort out my feelings. I appreciate that you don't show disrespect to me, saying that you love me and that it was all a mistake, just sex, nothing more, etc. I thank you for being honest about what happened. At least I'm assuming you're being honest, but I guess in the end I'll never know. It was Cindy's turn to clasp her head in her hands in despair. What he said was true, but it caused her to be in unbearable pain. She had a hard time keeping her eyes from looking up at him as he continued. You cheated with Bennett for eight months behind my back, once a month or more. You're right. I was completely unaware of your actions because I trusted you with everything. My love, my heart, my very life. I know I can never trust you again. Cinderella is dead, and there is no Prince Charming to come to her rescue. I've never felt hopeless in my life, and I hate that feeling, but I think it's the only honest, unclouded feeling I feel in my heart. I don't know what I will do, but I will not divorce you now or in the near future. I once heard a psychologist say in a lecture, if you are married with children and are thinking about divorce, go and throw yourself under the bus. Children cope much better with loss than with the choice of abandonment that comes with divorce. This has always been true for me but I never thought I would be in a situation where this applied to me. However, the alternative of playing house for the next 11 years until the twins graduate from high school and go off to college is unacceptable to me. I can't bear the thought of it. I can hardly bring myself to look at you, let alone pretend that we are who we were. So, about 48 hours into this terrible disaster, I was stuck, hopeless, and desperate. I don't see a way forward. 
I'm going to talk to a psychologist this week and see what she has to offer. Cindy looked at it hopefully. As if reading her thoughts, Rick quickly added, I'm not doing this for you or our marriage. I do this for my sanity and in the hope that I can find a path forward that allows me to retain at least a little bit of my dignity and love my children well. Rick stopped her and Cindy asked, Where are you and I staying? Should I rent a hotel or a small apartment? I want us to stay home for now, Rick replied. I think if once a week I go on a business trip for the night to give myself a break and you go away for at least two working weekends next month as you usually do, I can endure it. What you do, where you go, and who you spend time with when you are not at home is up to you. I won't let myself take care of you right now, so if you feel better in Bennett's arms, try to calm down. Rick, I'm not going to. Cindy began to protest. Rick held up the talk-to-hand sign. Please stop, Cindy. You act like you're talking to someone who cares about what you do. The only way I'm still breathing right now is by taking care of you the same way you've been taking care of me for the last eight months. You didn't care about me and my life, now I make the same choices as you. Maybe a counselor can help me figure out a better way to protect myself, but until then, you're on your own. They both sat and cried for the next half hour, saying almost nothing. No one extended their hands across the table and said the reassuring words, We'll find a way to get through this. They crossed their arms over their chests, lowered their heads, and cried. Lori's prophetic warning came true. The bagpiper came on call, and Cindy felt that the fee was more than she could bear. At that moment, she had no way of knowing that the piper had not yet fully performed everything. For the next month, they lived an unreal life. In front of the children, they pretended that everything was normal and good. They went to Sarah's soccer matches and Michael's karate lessons. At the parents' meeting in the middle of the month, they were convincing. S Snyder never noticed that anything was wrong. After the kids went to bed, things were different behind closed doors. Cindy looked pleadingly at Rick, expecting that he would want to talk, and Rick did everything possible so as not to completely fall apart. Cindy took responsibility, perhaps unlike some wives, but this did not relieve Rick of his feelings of betrayal and humiliation. Every week, Rick told the kids he was going away on a business trip for the night. He left late in the evening and returned only for dinner the next day. He used this time to walk, think, and plan his future path. He knew that if he wanted to continue in the same spirit, he would have to meet with his psychologist for a long time. Rick became a partner in his firm because he was great at analytics. He could evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of investments better than anyone else. He was attentive to detail, and even the slightest opportunity or risk did not escape his attention. He now applied this thinking to his family life. Pros and cons of living with Cindy How will it affect the children in the long and short term if they live together in a lie or divorce or? How would the firm react if this became known? They like me partly because of my loyalty to Cindy and the family. What will happen with finances during a divorce, marriage, or? What will Cindy do with her business? Continuing to work with Bennett is not at the forefront of her mind, but does she realize it? Is Cindy just regretting what happened, or does she want something different and better in her life? She was hurt when she got caught, but how will she cope with who she has become and what she's done? What options do I have? Is there anything else other than divorce or staying together? It was this last question that finally caught Rick's attention as the best possible path. There was a third option. It was radial and would have been incredibly difficult to implement, but it might have been the best solution for all concerned, even him. So, on the third night of his business trip away from home, Rick sat on the Hotel Patio Marriott Courtyard, where he was hiding. He began to look at his decision from all sides and angles. Its planning must be precise, and its execution even better, but it is possible. Just possible. Two weeks passed, and the plan was still in its infancy, but Rick thought it was going well enough that he decided to have a serious conversation with Cindy. He knew it might take a couple of hours, but it had to be done. He asked Mrs. Bryce Bowling to babysit the children, and then deliberately drove Cindy back to the park, 
where they had their first conversation about her infidelity. Returning to the same picnic table where the disaster had loomed before them both, they continued their conversation. Rick started. Cindy, I know the last few weeks have been terrible for both of us. I appreciate your response to my request for space and time to reflect. I want to share a few things with you and then give you the opportunity to respond. I hope you don't mind. Cindy nodded affirmatively, and he continued. I don't want to rehash everything that happened, especially the night I ran into you and your boyfriend Bennett. I already told you that I am crushed to the core. I am not a perfect person, and I am not a perfect husband, but I have always been 100% committed to us and our children. I have never cheated on you, even when flirting with other women. The thought of someone replacing you in my heart is unimaginable. I was amazed from the day I met you and thought you felt the same. We were together, and we didn't need anyone else. I just always assumed we'd grow old together. I was wrong about the depth of your devotion to us, and that we had any chance of remaining husband and wife. Cindy looked at Rick with longing in her eyes. Rick, she pleaded, I know I don't deserve a second chance, but I hope we can figure out some way to get rid of the pain and betrayal that I brought into our relationship. I don't want to give up on us. I want to work as hard as I can and with every fiber of my being to see if we can stay together. Rick stared off into the distance for a moment before answering. I know you're serious, Cindy, and I've thought long and hard about this option for us. On the one hand, I really think that recognition and forgiveness might be enough to keep us together. Hearing this, Cindy looked at him hopefully. But, Rick continued, I decided that it wouldn't work for me for two reasons. First, while I'm sure we could achieve forgiveness, I don't see a way to restore trust. Truth be told, if you told me the sky was blue and the grass was green, I wouldn't have believed you. Never again will you leave our door for work, and I will not suspect that you are going to meet your lover or your new lover. Never again will I be able to live with you without doubting your loyalty. Secondly, I will never be able to touch you the way a husband touches his wife without seeing the face of the man you deliberately chose over me, over and over again. You wanted him, not me. You gave yourself to him without thinking about my love or our relationship. I can never imagine ever looking at you again and not seeing the reflection of Bennett Davis in my gaze. Cindy's shoulders slumped. She knew he was right and wanted to let him know that she would continue to be faithful to him for the rest of their lives, but she also knew that she had no right to demand his trust. I want to fight for us, Rick. Don't you think we're worth fighting for? That was the first time Cindy saw what could only be described as naked rage in his eyes. When he glared at her, she physically recoiled from him. He seemed to have some control over his emotions, but there was a sharp edge to his words. Fight for us? Are you going to fight for us? Do you want me to fight for us? What do you think I did every day while we were married? By working hard and moving up the career ladder, I fought for us. Spending time with our wonderful children means fighting for us. Trying to remember all the things you love and enjoy, and to make sure I provide them to you regularly, I fought for us. I have always intentionally fought for you to know that I am crazy about us being together forever. How did you fight for us, Cindy? You slept with Bennett Davis multiple times. I'm sorry, I don't understand how I stopped fighting for us, Cindy. You quit eight months ago, and now you're hurting. I won't accept what you did and move on as if nothing happened. Rick took a deep breath and continued. Tears flowed from both of their eyes. I want to ask you so many questions, Cindy, but there is no point in asking them to someone who has constantly lied to you over a long period of time. How can I ever trust your words? You might be sorry, but maybe you'll just say this so you can go back to meeting Bennett behind my back. I want to ask if you learned anything from this, but no matter what you say, I think the most important lesson for you will be how not to get caught next time. I want so badly to go back to our old conversations when we shared our feelings with each other, but this couple no longer exists. You killed us with your deceit, lies, and betrayal. There is no turning back. There is only moving forward with the best possible solution for all of us. I realized we spent the night at the Ritz after you were with Bennett. You slept with him over the weekend, and then you came home and let me win you dinner theater, 
whom I considered my faithful wife. God, how you must have laughed at me inside. Your little cuckold, not knowing what a fool he was, was so excited to hear how proud his wife was of him. What a complete idiot I was. But nothing more. Cindy had no objections, only deep sadness at how badly she had hurt the man she said she had loved with all her heart, her whole life. He was right, and he fought for them every day. It was she who spat on his love with her infidelity. This is because of her callousness towards the husband whom she adored less than a year ago. But her passion, her lust and selfishness overshadowed all this. Are you going to divorce me, Rick? She finally asked when she could find the right words. No, Cindy. I'm not going to divorce you, and I'm not going to stay married to you. I'm looking for a solution that I think will suit everyone. This will not be without pain and loss, but I believe it is the only reasonable solution. I promise I'll explain it all to you in just a few weeks. I'm not going to tell you what to do, Cindy, but I'm going to explain my steps and my path in detail. I'm not asking for your opinion on my choices because, frankly, I don't trust you to have my interests or our children's best interests at heart. Once you understand my decisions, you will be able to make your own. I will not try to control you in any way. But how will I know if you don't share it with me now? Cindy asked, genuinely confused by the direction the conversation was taking. She wanted so badly to reach out and hug him, and for him to hug her, but it seemed like that would never happen again. Rick looked her straight in the eyes with deathly calm, an almost painful sense of resignation to fate, and answered, You will find out. They talked for a few more minutes. Cindy gently pushed him toward Rick's vague explanation, but he didn't budge. He was sure she would understand when the time came. A few months ago, my friend and colleague Lori warned me that if we danced to his bagpipes, sooner or later a bagpiper would appear and demand payment. I think she was right. Rick was surprised to hear that Lori knew what was happening and how she tried to warn Cindy and Bennett. This only hurt him more. You mean that before you slept with Bennett, you were warned and you didn't stop? Didn't you come to me to tell me about your struggle? Did you just carry on? Tears were now flowing abundantly from his eyes. Her husband was crying. Cindy burst into tears again and dropped her head into her hands, sobbing uncontrollably. Rick stirred, and she thought maybe he was coming to hug her. Please, God, let him come and hug me, she prayed in the depths of her soul. Instead, he stood in front of her, crossing his arms over his chest. When she looked up at him, he said, the bagpipper will come soon and demand at least partial payment. Maybe someday the time will come for full payment. Two weeks and four days later, Rick left for his weekly business trip, where he could be alone and deal with his pain. He hugged and kissed his children goodbye, and Cindy thought he looked a little sadder than he had the last couple of days. It's probably hard for him to say goodbye even for 24 hours, she thought. Cindy began to sleep better at night because she took melatonin, which helped her fight insomnia. Rick suggested that she let the children spend the night with Mrs. Part Bowling and her cat. She became almost an aunt to the children. Rick suggested that after a couple of glasses of wine, she would be able to get a good night's sleep. Cindy agreed and Mrs. Bowling was more than happy to host her young friends. The next morning it was 5.30 and her cell phone had been ringing non-stop for three minutes before she heard it, turned around, and picked up the phone. The screen simply stated that it was calling 911. I'm listening, Cindy said, trying to force herself to wake up. Is this Cindy Thomas, Richard Thomas's wife? Said a very professional voice on the other end of the line. Cindy sat up abruptly in bed. Nobody called him Richard. Yes, it is. Everything is fine. Sorry, Mrs. Thomas. But let me clarify that you live at 918 South El Camino Court. Is that correct? Yes, she said, almost shouting into the phone. And could you please tell me what kind of car your husband drives? Dark gray 2019 Lexus E's. Why are you asking? Something happened. Mrs. Hattie Thomas, I regret to inform you that your husband was involved in an automobile accident on California Highway 79, west of Pacific Crest Trailhead, near Warner Springs. Oh no, my God, Cindy exclaimed, is he okay? 
Is he in the hospital or in the ambulance? I'm sorry to tell you, Mrs. Frese Thomas, but the accident was fatal. I don't know any other details, but his body has been taken to Uck San Diego Medical Center and should arrive there within the hour. I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Cindy was stunned and for a moment could not move or even comprehend what she had just heard. Then her head exploded at the news, and her screams would have been heard in the next block by anyone who was awake at that hour. She cried and screamed into her pillow for almost an hour before she was completely exhausted. Finally, she began to think. She had to tell the children, but when and how. She needed to call her mom and Rick's parents in Denver. She needed a friend, but she didn't know who to turn to. She urgently needed to go to the morgue, but could she bring herself to get behind the wheel? Kelly was in Europe on business and wouldn't be able to help for a few days, if at all. She rinsed her face with water, got dressed as quickly as she could, pulled her hair into a ponytail, and headed to the front door when the doorbell rang. How strange, she thought, it's still so early. It was Brad Stanton, the family lawyer and one of Rick's best friends. He looked like he had been beaten with a baseball bat. Cindy, I heard the news about the accident. She just showed up on the morning news. I'm very, very sorry. With these words, she melted in his arms, sobbing and shaking violently. Brad held her at the door for a moment. Not a minute had passed before Mrs. Bowling emerged from her house in her dressing gown, hurrying across the lawn with worry written all over her face. Cindy couldn't speak, so Brad filled in the blanks. Mrs. Bowling began to cry, but she also came to take the young woman into her caring arms. Moments later, Cindy began to regain consciousness and insisted on being taken to a hospital in San Diego. I have to see him. I have to see my Rick. Brad and Mrs. Bowling agreed that she would watch the children, make up a short story about where Mom had been, and take them to school. They will find out everything soon enough, and they don't have to do it now. Brad insisted on giving Cindy a ride, and within five minutes they were on their way. Cindy's phone began to ring off the hook with calls and text messages from friends. She called her mother, who said she would take the first flight available. Cindy then had to break the news to Connor and Lily Thomas, Rick's parents. It was terrible. They also promised to fly on the first flight they could catch. They expected to be there by the time the children returned from school. Then Cindy turned off her phone, looked out at the Pacific Ocean, and started crying again. The next five days were pure hell. She explained to the children, and thank God the grandparents and Mrs. Bowling were there to help. Talked to authorities, insurance companies. They had three separate life insurance policies, arranged funerals, and talked to clients who were involved in organizing weddings or family celebrations that Cindy managed. The list seemed endless. Cindy was also bombarded with questions. What did Rick do for more than an hour outside the city on a deserted road early in the morning? Although no one used the word reckless, he was definitely speeding. The toxicology report showed there was nothing but blood in Rick's blood. No alcohol, illegal substances, or any other substances that could affect his ability to drive. His stomach contents showed that he had eaten steak, salad, and potatoes the previous evening, but had not drunk anything other than water. Cindy was confused. For his part, Bennett picked up the phone several times to text Cindy after hearing the news, but ultimately changed his mind. He was sure that she was suffering much more than anyone could imagine, and he also knew that hearing him would only make the situation worse. Lori was in a meeting with a new client when she heard the news. Her administrative assistant Stacy saw the hurt and anguish on her face, but also thought it was a little strange that she didn't look completely shocked. Lori did not attend the funeral. It was Friday morning, and everyone who knew Rick was there. Cindy was shocked to hear people talk about him. She knew he was an amazing man, but as she told story after story, it became clear that her husband was one of the most loyal friends, caring colleagues, generous boss, and respected person most of them knew. This only drove her further into despair as she couldn't help but think that if she had been more attuned to her husband, her affair with Bennett would never have happened and Rick would still be alive today. She was about to find out how right she was. On Sunday, late in the evening, 
Brad showed up at the house. He spoke briefly with Cindy's mom and her in-laws, who quickly took the children and headed out the door. When Cindy came down the stairs, she saw Brad sitting at the kitchen table, looking like a cat who had just swallowed a canary. Cindy was puzzled by his appearance and behavior. She offered to drink something, and he thanked her but declined, inviting her to sit with him instead. He began, Cindy, I need to tell you two things before I give you what I was assigned to convey. I'm your friend, but today I'm not here as your friend, I'm representing a client. This client is Rick. Cindy covered her mouth with her hand and gasped. Brad continued, Cindy, I say my client is Rick because even though he is dead, I still act as his lawyer, handling his affairs, both legal and financial. The second thing you should know without a shadow of a doubt is that I had no idea what was going to happen to Rick. Cindy found this strange. How could anyone know what would happen as a result of an accident, or even that an accident was going to happen? Rick noticed her confusion. Rick told me verbally and in writing that if anything happened to him, I had to follow his wishes. He paid me in full for the work, even though I suggested it as a friend. He insisted that everything be done legally and properly. I don't know the contents of this note, but I do know that it is a letter from Rick to you. I am instructed to give it to you and leave immediately before you open and read it. Cindy took the letter from Brad, her hands shaking violently. What else did he tell you to do? She asked. Brad looked a little embarrassed, but said, I'm sorry, Cindy, but this is confidential information between me and my client. Rick strictly forbade me to divulge to you any information about our conversations, my responsibilities, and his wishes. Once again, I apologize. With these words, Brad stood up and left without waiting for Cindy's answer. Cindy opened the letter and Piper reappeared to collect the amount due to him. Cindy, by now you already know that I'm dead and the funeral is over. Brad gave you this note and left. Children with my parents or with your mother. They know that you shouldn't go home for a few hours because it will be hard for you to digest. This is the third option, Cindy. This is the best way I could find. I loved you with all my heart and now that's gone. You took it. I think this is the best I can do. 1. You will find out that two weeks ago, I purchased a plot of two hectares on the shore of a lake in Eagle's Nest. It was for this reason that I was driving on Highway 79 where the accident occurred. The thing is, I bought this property after I was promoted, and we were both making good money. This was supposed to be a surprise for you and the children, a place where we could build and develop during the summer and long weekends. 2. This is, of course, a hoax. Buying real estate is a cover, but whatever you do, you have to stick to it. Insurance companies will not pay death benefits if they find anything suspicious about my death. I arrived at the new cottage to do some work and decided to get up early and return home. I was in a hurry because I had an appointment with a client at 9.30. That's why I was driving fast and lost control. Insurance companies may do a little digging, but they won't find anything. Brad will take care of that if you stick to the story. 3. Regarding insurance, I have changed my will in the last few weeks. 90% of my money, approximately $3,000, will go to a trust fund for the children. They will be able to get everything they need to pay for college, as well as graduate school if they want. They will receive the rest on their 30th birthday, split 5050 Again, Brad will take care of these details when the time comes. I'm leaving you 10%, or about $300,000 to tide you over until you start working again in about a month. I wouldn't leave you anything if my conscience allowed me, but I understand that you have to take care of the children while pretending to grieve for me so that it will be enough. 4. Regarding our beautiful children, some time ago I told you about the advice of a psychologist that it is easier for children to die than to get divorced. I did some thorough research and found several studies that support this. That's why I couldn't divorce you, Cindy. I couldn't do this to my children. I think someday they will find out the truth about everything, and then maybe they will hate me. I hope they don't, but if they do, I hope there is someone who will explain to them how unfair life can be sometimes. I am grateful that now and for the foreseeable future they can grieve their loss 
and not carry the burden of rejection that comes with divorce. 5. I can't advise you what else to do with your life. I'm guessing you can go back to Bennett, but perhaps there is someone else who has piqued your interest. Whatever you do, please this time think about the children first and do what is best for them. They'll be leaving home in 9-10 years, so maybe you could keep your lovers away until then. 6. Finally, I want to ask you for one small favor. When you are finished with this note, burn it until there are no ashes left. If insurance companies discover this, it will ruin our children's financial future. Read this a couple more times, but please, if I ever meant anything to you, burn this note. But don't worry, maybe you'll hear from me again someday. Rick. Cindy cried like she had never cried before. She fell to the floor, sobbing and wailing, screaming Rick's name. She was crushed by the consequences of her affair and feared it was more than she could bear. After about an hour, she finally found the strength to sit down and reread the note two more times. Then she went to the fireplace and burned it until all that was left was a handful of ashes. The bagpipper really came to the call. Or so it seemed to her. Twelve years have passed since that fateful day when Rick Thomas died on California Highway 79. In truth, he died the moment he saw his wife in the arms of another man, betraying him, betraying them, their children and their future. Everything else was just details of how and when. Cindy never remarried and always kept Rick's secret about his death. She did as he wanted and spent $300,000 caring for their family during her mourning period. More than a year passed before she returned to work. She tried to keep it up and be successful, but her business was mostly weddings and family functions, and it was more than she could handle. She went to work for a business event planning company and became very successful in her career. In terms of relationships, she dated someone from time to time, but she had never met anyone who was on Rick's level. She also considered herself damaged goods, although counselors had helped her with this, so she wondered. If she met someone and got married, would she do it again? Michael and Sarah begged her to go on dates and try to meet someone. Daddy would want you to be happy, they insisted. Yes, she thought. He always wanted me to be happy, and I used this as an excuse to destroy him. The pain came with renewed vigor. As for Bennett, about four months after Rick's death, he felt enough time had passed to send Cindy a note. According to Lori, they were no longer lovers, but Bennett was faithful and always tried to support his friend. One morning, he decided to send her a message. It said, I'm so sorry, B. A moment later, he received her answer. Me too. Goodbye. They never spoke again. Michael and Sarah had graduated from high school and were now 20 years old. They were in college. Michael, like his mother, loved people, loved the energy that groups of people enjoying each other could create, so he attended the University of Southern California, studying hospitality and marketing. Sarah was more like her father and loved analytics. The ability to work, to find a solution that's what made her get out of bed in the morning. She ended up going to Stanford to study economics. Even though they were only eight years old when their father died, the loss of their father deeply hurt both of them. The thought that daddy won't come home weighed heavily on them for a long time, but their mother and grandparents worked very hard to help them overcome the pain and begin to enjoy life. Each of them, in their own way, decided that part of their motivation in life would be to honor their father's memory. On a warm spring morning, Cindy sat at her desk in her apartment. She was drinking hot black coffee while reviewing a new contract for an executive planning retreat when her doorbell rang. When she opened the door, she was greeted by Brad Stanton. Brad, it's been a few months, Cindy said with a smile, reaching out to hug him. I am so glad to see you. Brad hugged her back in a friendly way, but a little stiffly. Thank you, Cindy. Can I come in and talk to you for a minute? Cindy noted that there was something formal in his voice. It didn't feel like a friendly conversation. Of course, Brad. Can I offer Yow Cup coffee? No thanks. I can only stay a couple of minutes. They sat down at the kitchen table, and Brad began. Cindy, as you know, today would have been Rick's 45th birthday. Cindy cringed. She had completely forgotten that today was April 7th, Rick's birthday. 
she made a mental note to call the kids as soon as Brad left. As you know, before Rick died, he changed his will and left instructions about what he wanted to do in the event of his death. Cindy, I'll be honest with you and say that I knew something was wrong. He felt bad, but he didn't tell me what was wrong. As his friend, I pressed him. As his lawyer, I was obliged to follow his instructions. He never let me understand what was going on. Until today. Cindy's eyes widened in surprise and confusion. What do you mean, Brad? Cindy, before he died, Rick wrote me a long note that he never gave. This morning, at exactly 6 a.m., there was a loud knock on my door. When I opened it, it was a courier with an envelope addressed to me. I didn't recognize the return address. It was some post office box in Austin, Texas. I was a little angry that I was disturbed so early, but my curiosity was at its peak. I returned to my office and opened the envelope. Inside was a letter from Rick. It was typed and ran to 12 single-spaced pages. Attached to the letter was a short note, handwritten by someone named Lori. Cindy began to tremble as the pain and memories began to return in full. Brad continued, The note simply said, Please read carefully and follow the instructions. L. Then I started reading Rick's note. The first line was so typical of Rick. Hey buddy, get your ass out of bed. I need you to help me finish some unfinished business. Yes, I know it's 6 a.m. I told them at 6 sharp and paid a little extra to make sure they could rely. I won't go into detail about the rest of the note, Cindy, except to say that Rick shared everything with me. The whole nine yards is in the details. He fell silent for a moment, letting her realize this. He noticed that tears appeared in her eyes. I have no idea how you could do this to such a wonderful guy like Rick. With the guy who gave you all his love and devotion to the last drop. With the guy who ultimately gave his life to you. Brad stood up and finished his work, handing Cindy a white letter-sized envelope with her name written on it. He said, Cindy, I never want to talk to you again. I will stay in touch with Michael and Sarah because they are my best friend's children. If I see you at a social event, I will be polite, for his and their sake, not for yours. But don't ever try to contact me in any way. Do you understand me? Cindy could barely say a word, but she looked at Brad and said, Yes, I understand. With these words he turned and left, but as he left, she heard him mutter, Damn selfish cheater. The envelope lay on the table, as if inviting Cindy to open it. She recognized the handwriting. It was Rick's handwriting. It took her a few minutes to gather the courage to open it, but eventually she did. Cindy. Twelve years have passed since the events that led us to this morning took place. In my last note to you, I mentioned that perhaps you would hear from me again someday. Perhaps someday the children will find out what happened to us and to them. Well, today is that day. 1. When I found out that Lori tried to talk you out of cheating with Bennett and you ignored her advice, I decided to ask her for help. She is the only person on the planet who knows about my intentions. She begged me not to go through with it. She even said that I could pick up the kids and come stay with her in Austin. Imagine, this is a woman with real character. I wish I had met her before I saw you. In any case, when I refused, she agreed to comply with my wishes. 2. My first request was that she keep this letter until today, until my 45th birthday. At this point, she was supposed to give Brad this letter along with another letter for him at exactly 6 a.m. In her note, Lori asked him to read my letter to him and then give the letter to you. I had a backup plan to get this note to you no matter what, but I hope that Brad and Lori are in good health and can help me complete my work. 3. This morning both Michael and Sarah received a similar note from me, which describes everything that happened 12 years ago. I didn't leave anything out. Since they are adults, I believe they have the right to know the truth. The whole truth. The statute of limitations for insurance fraud in California is four years, so their inheritance is completely safe. As I mentioned in my previous note to you, they may hate me for this, but I'm sure Brad and Lori will help them deal with what happened. Good luck trying to let go of the lies you've been telling your children for the past 12 years. I'm sure that if they want to talk to you, they will have many questions. 
4. If your mother and my parents are still alive, they will receive a similar note as the partners in my firm. 5. As for Bennett, there will be a full-page article in the Santa Barbara News Press today detailing his antics with you. It explains in detail how you two planned and organized amazing wedding events while you cheated on me and he slept with a married woman. The article ends with a strong call for people to take their weddings elsewhere. I probably won't be able to destroy him, but I really hope it will make his life miserable for a while. Maybe you two can get together, if you haven't already, and spend time together to ease the pain. By the way, you are mentioned separately in the article, so some friends and colleagues may also have questions for you. 6. Cindy, almost 13 years ago, I thought we were so happy and happy with each other as only any couple can be happy. All this turned out to be a lie. A tragic lie. So, Cindy, you set the tone, you enjoyed the dance, now it's time to pay according to the bills. In full, Rick. Moments after Cindy read Rick's note, her phone started ringing off the hook. Six months later, all three of Bennett's properties were sold at large losses to the owners to an Austin investment group Davis Bennett, at the age of 53, suffered financial ruin. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.